possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello and welcome to the ITU GA podcast. I'm Mikey Stafford. Um, massive weekend ahead of us, lots and lots. Five five senior championship matches on Saturday, eight of them on Sunday across the two codes. So we're, we're dividing and conquering again. So we're going to look at the hurling first in the company of Derek McGrath, Colin Keyes and Rory O'Neill. How are we all doing, gentlemen? Good, Mikey. Good morning, morning brother. Oh, afternoon now. Right, this is, this is a, an odd one, I suppose. It's not very often, if, if ever, you get four provincial hurling semifinals on the one one weekend it's it's going to be a bit a bit of a a feast Derek but would it be fair to say your appetite wouldn't have been overly whetted by the two quarterfinals we had last weekend they were they were high scoring but did they to you to me at least they they just seem to lack perhaps a little bit of championship intensity yeah but I think a bit of that was just acclimatizing to the first weekend as much as much as anything else I think it was you know just a kind of a a psychological battle for us all when, when you're so used to the other, the other aspects of it, you know, I think a, a co- as the week has gone on, I'm kind of a little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit more, uh, I suppose, calculated in terms of, you know, uh, coming to the reasons as to why A, they were so high scoring or B, they were lacking atmosphere. I think we just established in our mind that it's different and the first weekend was always going to kind of, kind of align itself to that difference, if you like, and, and that's what's led to probably debate this week. Uh, I'd expect this weekend to be a little bit different or different again in terms of maybe blood and thunder type championship approach just have the feeling that it's coming a sense it more than anything else but uh yeah it's it, it was different but but as i said as the week went on uh, you know lots to, lots to, lots of excellence on show at the same thing yeah a lot of people obviously ca- uh, call them talking about the newsletters which aren't really new they're just yellow they've they've held off on the on the the, the developments inside the slitter so nothing's changed there apart from it going from white to yellow and scores have been trending up for years anyway, and it's down to a, a variety of reasons, really, isn't it? It's conditioning of players, it's the, si- you know, it's the size and design of hurls, it's the consistency of slitters. Um, it's not one thing, but I suppose when you get two matches like this weekend, where even a leash team who were, weren't great and were relying on a lot of frees scored 23 points and were still quite convincingly beaten, it's, it's an odd one, isn't it? Uh, it's, Mikey, it's bitter faster, stronger, uh, and that happens across a, a range of sports. It's just the athleticism of hurlers now is so great uh, that the mechanics of striking a ball is so much better, and obviously the speed of the puckouts is a huge factor in that the keeper is waiting with ball in hand as the ball sails over the bar, and almost inevitably you have a Garrod Her- uh, Hegarty or a Tom Morrissey standing alone in isolation on the sideline in anticipation of this. That's how much these teams are actually thinking ahead, that you have someone and you look around and if you have that broad view of a pitch when you're actually at a game and you, you, players are reading it five, ten seconds ahead of the move that they're actually positioning themselves to receive a puck out and it's gone within. And, you, you know, you look at, you look at the, uh, the Tipperary County final, uh, the hurling final this year. <laughs> Um, Kiladangan's late comeback uh, against Lockmore and that was from a, such a swift delivery from a, from a puck out to, to go and win the game when everybody was it even, was, was it even legal Colm? was it legal how, how swiftly he pucked it out? <laughs> I, I mean I, I, I'm not so sure about that Rory straight off I'm not so sure but it was as quick a serve a return a serve if you can call it that as you will see and so it's not just the mindset of an inter-county player, it's the mindset of a club herder too that this is happening. You got to credit players here first and foremost before we delve into how we can, as we were discussing earlier, how we can tiger-proof because there is a, a similarity with with golf in that when Tiger Woods came along first of all, and you know that the equipment was changing all the time from the persimmon shaft to the graphite and all of that, and Tiger was one of the first players to really embrace athleticism, the gym and all that, and golf. And he was able to boom that ball so much further. And obviously a number of other players followed. And now we're into the era of Shambo, Bryson Shambo, who has bulked up so much and he's putting the ball even further. So golf had that defense of longer, longer, longer holes, bunkers, traps, everything like that, twists on a fairway, uh, whatever. Obviously, a, a, a GA pitch 
doesn't have that. But first and foremost, to go back to my point, you have to credit the players that they have actually maximised everything out of the game now. That it's almost you, you, you'd suspect that it's at, at its peak now in many ways. That in terms of in terms of scores and just ability to stay going, and it's a fitness element too that bodies and minds just aren't tiring. And obviously, the games are longer because you know that, that there's more added time. Even though there wasn't much added time at the end of the the Limerick Clare second half, that didn't prolong too much. But other games do because of substitutes and stoppages. It's all added on now, so it's all contributed to this. But where the game goes, if if there is a desire to slow it down, I don't know. Is there a desire to slow it down and create less scores? I would have thought the idea was you know scores scores are what uh, in, in enlighten people and illuminate games and all of that. And um, I just wonder one other point. And I, I've noticed it in football games over the last few weeks. I see very, very few mistakes from players standing over freeze, um, even from shots, everything. It, it seems to me that the absence of a crowd is creating less pressure. And players are you know, not feeling the heat of other you know, intense Saturday evenings, Sunday afternoons. They're just not feeling the same heat. And they're standing over freeze and they're standing over shots and making better decisions. And I think that may actually be a small contributing factor. I, like, you, know, you look at Mayo over the last two weeks in football. I know we're jumping onto football here, but they've scored 442 here mm. over two games. I mean, the, the scores are high in football too, uh, well up on what they were earlier in the year, as far as I can see. And that seems to be a trend. And I just wonder, is it the absence of a crowd, the absence of maybe... Maybe players just don't feel as nervous or challenged match. Really. Yeah, Owen, Owen Ryan, one of our uh, online journalists, did a piece Good on piece. this during the week and um, he spoke to Brian Carroll about that. And Brian Carroll said, now, you wouldn't be put off by abuse coming from the crowd or anything like that, but he did say it's just a natural human emotion reaction that, you know, if there are 10, 15,000 people watching your every move, you are a little bit more conscious of it and there is the the chance that you'll be thinking, what if it goes wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. it is definitely a factor, but as you said, I don't think it's down to the roaring of the abuse. Rory, the, the, no. it gets said, it gets said, you know, oh, hurling's becoming basketball, which is obviously a nonsense. But no, I don't think anybody wants to go back to 13, 12 All Ireland finals. But at the same time, I didn't, I, I didn't mind, I didn't, no, mind, didn't mind that in, in, in 1999. <laughs> yeah. well, is there, is there something said for as Colin said, there's a lack of mistakes. Is there, you know, there's, in a way, yeah, the, yeah. the games last weekend, and we can't judge a, a championship on mm. the two quarterfinals when they were, again, not the not exactly going to be, they weren't four out all mm. contenders going up against each other. But there was, there was a feeling that it was kind of you score one, we'll score one, and eventually yeah. someone will make a mistake. And I don't think the championship's going to be defined by that kind of play by any means, and nor would we mm. want it to be. Is what I'm trying to say, I suppose. Yeah, and look, look, one of the big things for me was um, I normally get one weekend off during the summer run and two years ago when Limerick won the All-Ireland 2018, I took off the um, the All-Ireland hurling semi-finals weekend and I had a sneaky feeling Cork might be there, so I was able to go to the game as a supporter and I watched the match and I was sat in a really good seat, halfway line. And I actually, like, I'm not necessarily a young man, but I'm not an old man either. And I found the game tricky enough to follow at times, uh, the speed of it. Like, the ball was only flying over the bar at one end, and you were kind of having a quick look up at the scoreboard. And by the time you, you cast your eyes back on to the, um, to the run of play, you were actually struggling. Well, where is the slitter gone? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and you, you were kind of like, okay, it's over in that corner. The next thing is flying over the bar. And it was a massive score again there. I think though what's happening with the high score and is a, as Colin uh, mentioned earlier, there is a combination of factors. There's obviously higher fitness levels. I don't the, the the hurlies are being made ever so slightly differently. There's a much probably greater focus on the aerodynamic nature of how a hurley is made. They're probably getting you know lads are stronger and they're fitter and they're faster, so they're getting more power into the strike. It's just like a Colin mentioned again in terms of the golf, but. I think a big thing for, for like like a big thing for me with hurling is there's no harm in asking the question. Like sometimes I find with the sport is that when you say anything negative at all, that it the uh, you know we'll say the custodians and guardians almost sort of take a hedgehog approach, 
and you know nothing to see here gov move along there's no, absolutely nothing wrong every sport should should self analyze and not be afraid to take an introspective look at itself and see whether or not these trends are good bad or otherwise i don't necess- i think a big part of it as well when you see the high scoring rates is like teams nowadays, and Derek is probably no better man to ask about stuff like this, but they would work, I get the sense that they work very hard on freeing up a loose player. So what you want very, you don't necessarily see the old school man to man where I'm going to mark my man no matter what happens and I'm going to make sure I'm going to keep him from getting a score. Teams are working on playing patterns now so that, that they're working to try and get a lad into a position where he can get a strike off completely uncontested. And when you're in a situation like that, inter-county players are going to bang on over the bar every time. Would that be fair, Derek? Yeah, it's a very, very good point. I think it's probably something I, I've probably been beating the drum on in the last, even when I was involved for the five years at Waterford, which is... Which is was the thirst that's there from players, my experience would have been for information, if you like. And, you know, and, and still being able to balance that information with, with having creativity. It's something I think it's very evident in the game. So, you know, I, I actually read a, a very good article with Paddy O'Brien, the Tipperary physio, during the, during the lockdown, where he spoke about the Tipperary players actually thriving off information and data. You know, and and that, that being kind of a representative of the modern player, if you like. That's not to say that a player can't be a maverick or can't have that bit of genius about him as well. So I, I think you're right. I think it is very important to ask, ask the question, but it's also to, important to bear in mind that there are training patterns, if you like, that, that are implemented in trainings that, that involve freeing up the player, keeping possession, you know, um, two or three passes before you give it in. Even if you watch the Limerick system in full flow, they actually, bar the Kenny semi-final last year, they rarely hit it into Galan in a situation where they don't think he's going to win it. You know, even though he's in there at times with, you know, one-on-one or one-against-three situation, they'll hold it. And I think it's only, if you analyse the start of the second half last Sunday, it's only when they got their game going with the depth of their half-forward line in their own half. It, it almost became like, not basketball, but certainly possession-based until the ball was on. And then they have such athleticism that they can break the lines. But I'm with Cullum on it. I think it's it's... It's, it's the development of the athlete, but the development of that kind of thirst, if you like, or that kind of want for, for more information, for the game to be better. And I am of the opinion that the game is better than it ever was. But it still doesn't mean we can't say, should it, will it plateau, or will it cut off, what should we do? I would be totally against changing anything that makes the game better. You know, I think it's sometimes it's incumbent on us as managers or players to, to kind of, to, to allow ourselves to go with that kind of seamless transition that's there, to kind of, you know, to, to man up and to, to, to upskill, if you like, to, to be in, in tandem with what's developing. I think that's, that's the difficulty for some over the years in terms of any change that might be embraced or, or otherwise. Yeah. We, we, like we, one change, one change, one change. I'd be very interested. Sorry, Mikey, and I guarantee you, Derek won't like this one, right? But one thing that always struck me as odd, bear in mind how far you can puck a slitter in hurling, right? in comparison to how far you can kick a football in, in obviously Gaelic football. Why does the goalkeeper have to kick it from the ground in football, even though he can get much less distance, yet the goalkeeper in hurling can puck it from the hand? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, look, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's a very good question, in actual fact, but it's a... Look, look... Like, if you, if you force the goalkeeper, for instance, now this is a madcap idea, I'd be interested to see it tested on a practical level, but if you force the goalkeeper to actually uh, address his puck outs from, um, we say, a dead ball scenario where it had to be lift and strike, I think you'd see a very different game all of a sudden. You would, but that now difference... Maybe, necessarily, not, maybe not the better, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and, and that's, it's the question, and, and, and my summation is that you wouldn't see a better game, so I... I yeah. No, and... and so even even on the keeper, if you watch closely, if you watch Mark Fanning at the weekend, uh, uh, you know if you watch the, the Cluxton type behaviours of the of the hurling goalkeepers now almost, you know you know obviously coming from Don Lowe himself over the years, but it's it's you know, just I remember in my last year in Waterford we were encouraging Stephen to come off the line because we might have a we might have Tyke sitting there as an extra defender, the full back can go on the goal for a few minutes, Tyke can go full back for a few minutes. And the goalie, sooner or later, will turn up off the shoulder of someone in hurling, pop a couple of points, be it kind of like in the roll and that's going to yeah. happen. And we have a big debate about, about where that's going. Or what sweeper, mean, sweeper keepers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's different and it's good. You know, and, it, and I think it's, it's only good for the game, you know, as regards their use of the ball. And it, look, the key is the use of the ball. I do expect, though, with the weekend in mind, 
I do expect that level of what people talk about in terms of intensity levels last week. I do expect some of that to be more evident this weekend. Mm, yeah, you'll have a bit yeah, more crash yeah. and thunder and you'll be here next week talking about the tackle count and, and the, there was no space for anybody. Yeah. I could be wrong. Well, let's let, make that point too, Derek, in that, in that, you know, last year, you must remember last year, Wexford and Galway drew 16 points each in Salt Hill. Now, obviously, yeah. the wind whips in there. So maybe we just shouldn't rush to judge after, after one weekend. And I, I'm Correct. around a long time now to know that sometimes, sometimes what we see in the first weekend of a championship in terms of freeze given or something, that mm. generally even, evens itself out over a period of time. Now, there's no doubt that scores are rising. I can recall in 2014, after the All-Ireland hurling final replaying, Kilkenny had won 217 to 214. And we were interviewing Brian Cody in the City West Hotel. And obviously, after the drawing game, 322 to 128, you know, the, the scores had really spiked and everybody probably celebrated that game as one of the greatest games ever. And that point was put to Brian Cody and he laughed and he said, well, he said, that may be the case and it may have been a great game. He says... I much rather the game last Saturday, which was the, the replay. <laughs> yeah. 217, 214, hooking, blocking, contests. There was less scores as a as a consequence, but Cody basically spoke said like, spoke, that spoke was, like a true defender. Yeah, <laughs> he said like that was basically defender. that was my type of game. He said, <laughs> I would have rather that. He says, Fair enough, fair enough if you're into scores. But it always struck me that uh, a game that was considerably less that produced considerably less scores that uh, that's the way he thought of it. So you know, the, the, the best games don't have the best scores for sure. Um, and in the case of that 2014 comparison, uh, was it better? Look, I personally thought that the drawn game was, was better because obviously it was more exciting, it was closer and oh, all of yeah. that. But, it's great honor. you know, when you think of what Brian Cody's view was, you know, the second game, obviously the one, and maybe it's mm. a bit shaped by that, by that, but a game that was 217 to 214, which in today's terms now is is low scoring. I mean, a team coming out and scoring 217 to win it, you're not going to see that too often. Yeah, right. Stop this philosophical conversation. We'll have no the time games. to actually look at the matches this weekend. We'll start at the beginning. We'll start with the first game in chronological order, which uh, Derek is Cork versus Waterford. Um, so neither of these teams have been out. We have nothing to base this on except what you've seen and heard. So come on, tell us who's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose oh. it. From a Cork perspective, without knowing too much, I know they played Wexford in the challenge match in Porky Reed last Wednesday night. Um, you know, Dara Fitzgibbon is obviously a massive loss, um, huge, huge loss, Derek. Absolutely yeah. huge loss. It could, just, know, just, just in terms of, yeah, just in terms of preparing for Cork over the years, like in, in 16 and 17 or 15, 16 and 17, you know, Fitzgibbon was someone we put huge stock into preparing for in terms of. He can open you up like his pace. You know, it's very hard to mark pace, and when he puts the ball in the hurley, he goes. So I think he's, and he's after filling out, and he's after filling out a bit now as well, Derek. I don't know yeah. if you've noticed, like yeah, yeah. he's really after. He's a proper man now, you know. So, yeah, like yeah. I think he's. A, I, 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 I think it's a game-changing loss to be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's. I think he's significant loss now. Now, the the one the one debate around Cork that I, you know, we all kind of have is was is around their defence and mm. in, in in sixteen. Sorry, in 17, when, when, when Cork beat Tip in the first round and we were playing him then in the Munster semi-final, I remember watching Cork that day and very noticeable how deep Luke Mead and, and Shane Kingston were. And they had a kind of a, a system in place whereby Ellis was just sitting at centre-back and they were protecting their backs with the work rate of their forwards, a la most teams, if you like. And I think you, you might see a, a return to that particular system of play where the backs are very, very zonal and, and forwards are just double-jobbing, if you like. You know, that snobbery that's often associated with Cork forwards, that they can't double job, I think, will, will not be evident amongst Kieran Kingston's team on, on, on Saturday. You know, and that's, that's, that's what I feel will happen, if you like. I think there'll be a high, there'll be a high work ethic from the Cork players because I think they've, they've had enough, really, of, of that kind of, you know, that, that thing that's, that's kind of almost kind of they're tainted with as being soft. I, like, I, for, I put, put it on record, I, I don't see any inter-county players being soft. Mm. You know, are they inconsistent at times? We're, we're all inconsistent as management, as writers, as producers, as, as teachers. We're, we can be inconsistent. Mm -hmm. We have insecurities, of course we do. But I don't think any inter-county player is, is, is soft, you know, as, as such, if you like. And I think, I think Cork will have had enough of that being said. And I'd be worried about the, the, the kind of motivation and reaction to two things. One, that they can't play in the winter. And two, 
that they're, they're perceived as being soft. So I'd be worried about that from a Waterford point of view. Having said all that, I'm going to give you the, the opposite view now, which I think Waterford, based on, on kind of the last two years, my last year, I suppose, and Horrocks last year, I think they would have got a lot of flack, like kind of about, about their trajectory kind of falling away, if you like. And I think the players have been very, very hurt by that. I think there's a, you no, know, there would have been stuff kind of, you know, bandied around that the players didn't care, etc., which, which I would see as completely untrue as well. And I think there's been a line in the sand moment here where I think I'd be very surprised if you don't see a Waterford team that is ready to fight on its back or who they represent and what they're about on, on, on Saturday. I'd be hugely surprised. And I actually think that fight will be enough. I think they're just going to bring an energy that hasn't been evident in the games last weekend to this weekend. And, and allied to that, I think expectancy levels in media circles and outside with Torrey's injury, hearing of another possible injury to, to, to Dara Fives as well, ahead of the weekend, maybe on, on Tuesday night on there. So I think, I think no, I think Tige's return and I think there'll be a freshness. I still think there'll be 9, 10 involved from 17, if you like, but I think there'll be a freshness with Desi Hutchinson, with Jack Fagan, with Jack Pender, with Connor Prunty, with um, Kieran Bennett even possibly in the forwards. And I think that, that freshness allied to the kind of fight that they're undoubtedly going to bring and their happiness, I think. I think it'll be enough to get Walter over the line and that might seem an unnecessarily kind of, an unjustified statement, but I just I feel it in me gut like that they're going to bring it, you know? Um, quickly, Colm, would you, would you go along with that? We do seem like we have two teams with a point to prove here, which is, uh, should make for a nice uh, curtain raiser for the weekend. For sure, I think it, I think I think it'll be uh, a far greater battle than anything we we uh, we saw over last weekend. That's that's a given, and I do think Waterford have, have a lot to claw back. But as have Cork too. There's no doubt about that. I'm just fascinated by almost the division between what we consider our uh, a team winter hurlers and teams that are going to un, will be unable to adapt. And Cork are very much in the category of those who people have said no, they're not going to go in these conditions, and yet. You know, the games are being played on some of the best surfaces. Yeah. Temple Stadium, Park of Cueve, when it goes to Crow Park. Will it really make that much difference? If you're a decent ball striker and you're, you're playing the same way, should it make that much difference that the temperature is down a little bit or, or, that, or that the wind is blowing a, a, little, bit, uh, a little bit sharper? I, I don't think it should. And it's a point Derek made many times before. Um, when he was Waterford manager and Cork were playing Waterford, and he'd list the, the forwards, the Cork forwards, uh, and go through them and come to the conclusion that if they get everybody out and if everybody hits their peak or their form, or even if four or five of them do, they've as good a forward line and maybe better than, than, than anyone in the game. And that still holds because Patrick Horgan came off the back of last year. And I know that championship is now 15, 16 months scoring 310. Uh, earlier in the league, I thought Shane Kingston. Uh, and he played very, very well in that league match in, uh, in Waterford. Waterford actually won that after a bad start. But Shane Kingston played, was really starting to come, I felt, in the, in, in the league this year. You know, Alan Cadigan was back to a bit of form after having missed, a, having missed out. Um, obviously, Seamus Harnady is, is always there, and what, what a warrior he is. Conor Lehan. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Dara Fitzgibbon had actually moved up to centre forward at, uh, over, the last, uh, over the last season. So that was further strengthening up there. So from my point of view, I think that still holds that Cork uh, have as a forward line that can compete, obviously, with anybody. It's how they align and how they set themselves up at the back that is really, that is really the question here. I just feel myself that uh, on form, they have forwards to hurt, to hurt anybody. And uh, I think that's enough to carry them here. Notwithstanding, I take Derek's, Derek's view that Waterford really will five in their backs. But I think Cork, too, have a lot to prove and to... To, to knock this perception that they can't hurl in the winter time or in the springtime during the league, I mean, where did that come from? Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll have to move. We'll move on to the other Ulster semi-final, sure. the Battle of Champions, which is uh, obviously uh, the All Ireland Champions against the League Champions. Um, they played early, early, early in the league, and um, Limerick. Had, I was just looking at it. Limerick had a pretty, pretty strong team out that day, and they came back from 13 points to four down at half time. John Kiley gave them a rocket. But looking at the Tipperary team, which obviously played fantastically in the first half and went out of it a little bit, Derek, they'll be getting back Brendan Maher, Noel McGrath, Dan McCormick, I think, uh, Bubbles and Seamus Callanan. Um, so 
you kind of almost forget because we haven't seen Tipperary for a while. The strength and depth in Tipperary, considering they bring in those under 20s and stuff from last year, they have a phenomenal panel to pick from, don't they? Yeah, and the reality is that probably any of the under 20s that we saw going so well against Clare last week, you know, won't be involved. And that, that, that actually is testament to the strength that they really have. Yeah, look, again, taking up Colin's point in the forward line, if you have a forward line, you know, Bubbles, Shamie Callan, Jason Ford, John McGrath, and then a kind of supplemented by the return of Honor Mar, etc. Tipperary have a serious, serious outfit. The question here, I suppose, probably be better answered retrospectively on Monday or Tuesday is the benefit. They always are, Derek. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the benefit of the game last week, you know, the 36 points, the confidence gained, the, the up to the tempo pace, as against Tipperary's under lean, particularly, their ability to be right on a big match day and their targeting of a kind of a a four match run to an all Ireland final picture, you know, and, and where that sits, if you like. That that's the interesting thing for me. Yeah. Uh Rory, it's um Limerick kind of made made light of the the injuries at the back the last day. Um obviously they're missing they could have English is probably touching goal if you back this week, I'd say. But Claire, the full forward line doesn't offer you the same kind of challenge as what Tipperary will offer if Tipperary Absolutely. decide to play that more direct game. Absolutely not. I was down in Thurles on Sunday last. Limerick were awesome. I, absolutely awesome. I mean, they are they're a machine. And they, I mean that in the best possible sense. This fixture for me is a dress rehearsal for the All-Ireland Final. I'm not entirely sure it will matter all that much who wins or loses because I see both of them um, re-emerging again and playing in a first Tipperary Limerick All-Ireland Final without question. And that's the one that will really count. Colm, how do you see it going then for the dress of so if we're going to call it that? I'd be very, very, very interested. Like, to me, Limerick have the most settled, if you like, team in, in hurling. They nearly know every time. I mean, if they had a full team to pick from, you could, you could pretty much name their team. Can you do that with anyone else? Like, we're, you know, we're, we're guessing about Waterford and Cork, what the makeup of their team will be. And there's a little bit of that with Tipperary because they have so many of these under-20 and under-21 players from the last two years, and some really talented players that were beginning to make their mark in a league campaign early this year, how much you can place emphasis you can place in that league, I'm not so sure. But Tipperary were fading out of games in the second half. Whether it's relevant to now is hard to know, because they were obviously in a much different cycle of training and all of that. And indeed, after the Galway game, where there was, I think it was a 15-point swing, they hopped off and went to, they went to Spain. So they were completely. They were obviously in a different cycle. Maybe that's not as relevant now, but the temptation will be there for for Liam Sheedy to start integrating more of Jake Morris a lot more and Jerome Cahill, Dylan Quirk. These guys that were making strides over the last while. So her John Kiley, that's a very very settled team against a Tipperary team that could be settled, but the temptation and the options are there to start making changes and integrating. So be very interested in in Tipperary. I think the game last weekend a huge benefit to Limerick, a really, yeah. really good benefit. I think the power of their half-forward line, Hegarty, Hayes, Tom Morrissey, I think it's the most exceptional line in the game at the moment. They power their way, not just, I mean, look at the striking of your old Hegarty last, last weekend. Uh, a certain man of the match only for Tony, Tony Kelly's presence. Yeah. And if you yeah. go back to the Waterford game before the league, I think he hit 1-5 that evening as well. So he's a player really on top of his game. Kyle Hayes look, looks to have really renewed again. Uh, Aaron Galan. I just think the power of that half forward line drives Limerick to victory here. Yeah. Well, we'll have to wait and see. It's live on TV, which is always nice to say. We have two get two semi finals in Leinster as well, which we'll have to breeze through pretty quick because Rushing McConville will be in the waiting room soon and God knows he probably doesn't want to talk about hurling. Um Derek I'll Bring him bring him in. They love their <laughs> hurling in our man. Uh, he's a former, he's a fo- now, don't forget, Mikey, he's a former uh, member of the Leash Hurling Backroom team. Oh, that's right, he is. Yeah, Sorry. Get him in, get him in. He's not here yet. If he comes in, I'll drop him in on top of it. He'll have some yeah, views. Yeah. Uh, Derek, um, it pains me to say that you have to go back to 1996 for the last time Wexford beat Galway in the championship, which is quite something. Um, they've been very, very close games between these two in, pre- in recent years. Galway, to me, as a Wexford fan, have been uh, suspiciously, worryingly quiet. Uh, I think the two Burks supposedly are carrying injuries. Wexford, supposedly there were some injuries to Matthew Hanlon and, and Lee Chin, but as I heard is they're not, they're not going to be not likely to keep them out. Um, it's a very tight game. Obviously, I think Wexford are going to win by a cricket score, but um, that's just my heart talking. How do you see this one going? 
not likely to be involved now is 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 like Davy language there. I'll definitely yeah. be involved. <laughs> yeah, look, I, 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 um, I fancy Wexford to be Galway. I just think they're first of all the memory of of last year's game against against Tipperary in terms of motivationally, like the last time they were up there, like they didn't, you know, they didn't finish the job. If you like, I think that'd be a huge fuel for them. Um, I know on the recent challenge match circuit they they got a bit of a hockey in from Limerick and, and who doesn't at the moment. But I think that kind of channel yeah. there. They're kind of driven, kind of uh, you know, approach for for a challenge match against Waterford, and I know that went quite well for them. And um, I just fancy them. I think they they know their system, they know their structure. There's not a newness to what they'll they'll do, and I think they'll they'll, they'll relish Croke Park to be back in Croke Park in particular, given the type of game that they play and the surface in Croke Park. So I fancy I fancy um and um, extra to win that. Even if you analyse the second half of the game in in Salt Hill last year, or in Pierce Stadium. Wexford should have won that game. You know, they, they, they actually, you know, they should have won that game. They had a couple of chances there near the end of it. Carl Dunbar had a very good chance. And um, you know, I, I just fancy Wexford to have too much of too much familiarity, if you like, in terms of what they're doing and um, mm. get them over the line. Yeah, it, Colin, it, it does seem like Davy stayed on for a reason. He saw potential, etc. This, not the season he expected it to be, but he obviously sees this as the culmination of, you know, four or five years' work now. Yeah, uh, we we spoke about Cork and Waterford uh, having something to prove. I feel Wexford are probably in that category, even though they're Leinster champions and that they didn't yeah. close it out uh, with uh, numerical advantage uh, in last year's All Ireland semi final. And really, realistically, they didn't really come close. So they have to come back and find a bit. But I think I agree. I think they will find something. I think Crow Park will will suit them. Uh, will suit them for this fixture. Uh, a bit of interest around. If Dahi Burke doesn't play, and it looks like he won't, he has he struggled in the Galway uh, in the Galway final uh, yeah. for Turlock Moore uh, at the beginning of the month, and had to come off and went back on again in that game. So clearly, clearly there's an issue there. And if he doesn't play, questions over the over the who fills in. Gerard McInerney was there earlier in the year, but I was actually at that Galway hurling final, and uh, Fintan Burke gave him absolutely fantastic yeah. display for St Thomas as a fullback, really, really strong. Um, Shane O'Neill was at that game. Be interesting to see did he take anything from that and maybe place place him on the edge of the square. He was as half back, but he looked really, really good at fullback, really comfortable that day. But I think Waterford or Wexford's uh, Wexford's familiarity with each other, with their system, with the game, I think they'll be driven. No doubt, Galway will. But uh, I think on this on on this occasion, I just give Wexford a slight edge. Okay. Yep. Well, I'm glad we had you on the podcast, lads. Um, and then finally, then in a word, because we really haven't got time, uh, can anybody see Dublin, uh, given last week's performance against Leash, can they see him shocking Kilkenny? Anyone? No. No. In a word. <laughs> Colin? No. No, I don't. I think uh, I, I think TJ TJ Reid and Colin Colin Fenley, just as they did with Ballyhale this year, I think they drive Kilkenny, and I think they drive Kilkenny to a Leinster title. Uh, they're already. Ah, they're Colin, already, you were doing so well up until that. Mikey, I'm sorry to disappoint <laughs> you, but I do think, I think a bit of renewal about Kilkenny in terms of Leinster. I mean, they'd be going, they'd be going if they don't win one. They'd be going. Is it three years, four years without it? Then at this stage, uh, mm. I think I think there'll be big emphasis, and obviously, uh, if they do get to, uh, if it is Kilkenny or Wexford in the finals, uh, I think there'll be um, a revenge factor there. So look, I think Kilkenny will be will be really ready for this. Okay. Listen, lads, it's a fantastic weekend to hurl. I'm really looking forward to it. Derek, yeah, well, thank you very uh, much. Just, you know, ju- just, just one last point there, Mikey. Yeah, so just on the Galway Wexford, it's our first offering on Saturday. I know there's a lot of sport on this weekend, but it should be, it's worth mentioning that Saturday game live kicks. It's live coverage off with Galway Wexford, something we're all ob- obviously really looking forward to live from Croke Park. And Tip and Limerick is obviously live on Sunday with Kilkenny and Dublin available on GAA Go. It is indeed. Derek, we'll let you leave. We have to get the uh, former Leash hurling coach in here now to talk <laughs> yeah, about the big ball. So we'll catch you again, Derek. Thanks very much. Mind yourself, that so. He hits it. He hits it. Oh. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses. We're back after Mar- Marty's preaching at us. And Oshi McConville has joined us. How are you, Oshi? Hi, thanks, Mikey. Very well, thank you. Oshin, we had a very philosophical debate about the future of hurling there, which is fine. We usually have that in football every three to four weeks, so it's scheduled in for a couple of weeks' time. So we're just, we're just going to preview the matches. And um, it's definitely your own your home province, which has the, as always in the provincial yeah, yeah. stages, has the most interesting matches. 
Saturday is Monaghan v Cavan. I saw Maliki Clerken had a good stat there. He says this is the only good stat he's ever come up with. He tweeted that um, they have the most draws of any two counties in championship football. And surprisingly, they haven't played each other near as much as, say, Kerry and Cork have played each other. So I think the spread is four points. And uh, I don't think anybody expects them it to be that wide, even if Monaghan, you know, had a nice uh, uplifting finish to their season. Um, these are always tight games, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they are. And it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I actually think Calvin were unlucky enough to, uh, to make the drop into Division 3. Um, if any of you remember last year, um, Monaghan went into this game uh, overwhelming favourites and, and Calvin won the game to be honest very very comfortably mm. um, so if, any, if last year's anything to go by I mean the, the big thing for me is there's a huge amount of changes huge amount of changes on, on, the, on the Calvin team um, there'll be a few new faces on the, on the Monaghan team as well it looks like a slightly different structure as far as Monaghan are concerned uh, I still think they're a bit of a work in progress. But y- you look at Monaghan, you look at, you know, uh, Kerry outplayed them completely. But Monaghan were still in the game with 10 minutes to go, uh, even five minutes to go, you know, put a ball into the square. You know, Tommy Walsh plucks it out of the sky. Somebody gets a fist of that, it's a different game. And you're thinking, how were Monaghan still in that game? That was one of the games I did. Uh, one of the, that was the first game I did, actually. Um so for me, sort of, you know, form does go a little bit out the window. And on the face of it, it's a Division One team against a Division Three team. But I don't think there's that sort of, that, that golf is actually um, true when it comes to Monon and Cavan. Mm. I, I could not believe the contempt and the dislike and the hatred that goes on between Monaghan and Cavan. It is. <laughs> it is. You know, people talk about the people talk about the old firm, but. I honestly, last year was vicious, you know, yeah. and I'm not talking about on the pitch, I'm talking about off the pitch. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of unsavory scenes this year. Yeah, there is a lot riding on uh, There is a lot riding on this game. So, um, I, there's not a huge gulf between them. And, and to be honest, I expect Monaghan to win, but, but you know, a Cavan win wouldn't hugely <laughs> surprise me. Um, Colin, Cavan were definitely unlucky. Division two, as expected, came down to like, that. Leash resurrection was kind of mad. Um, but you, you get the impression Mickey Graham is not a kind of manager. I don't think his whole season's plan would have been built around that match, etc. He does seem like a man who's very, he, he has a long view here. And part of his long view, you would imagine, is doing particularly well in Ulster. And a slightly longer championship season might be more important than what division you're playing in next year. Talton Cup, future notwithstanding, etc. I think Cavan's drop to Division 3 is a huge psychological blow one way or the other because they went into that <clears throat> that Roscommon game. Roscommon were down some of their best players and while that validates the strength of the Roscommon squad, no doubt about it, uh, that game, I felt Cavan should have pressed on and won. That they didn't obviously suggest to me, having lost to Kildare the previous week, that they're not in a very, very rich vein of, vein of form going in against the Monaghan side, that I, I think three points off Kerry is, is not a bad form line because I think, I think that will frank itself as time goes on because uh, I think Kerry have really stepped up here. So to be within three points, obviously not playing particularly well as it seemed, um, I, think, uh, I, I think that puts Monaghan in a good place. You know? and, and I would say that Mead went up to Clonus last weekend hell-bent on getting something from Division 1. So it wasn't as if they were playing a relegated team that were switched off. They weren't. I know Mead were really, really gunning to pick something off. So, again, they had to manage the load between staying in Division 1 last weekend with an eye to a game six days later. I feel Monaghan are in a better place here. Last year's game, they were able to keep tabs on Conor McManus pretty well. Shown in the last, in the second half when he came on against Kerry and last week against Mead that... uh, He's a man that really wants this championship. Uh, there aren't many more opportunities. And you know, I remember a conversation with him earlier in the year where he said, you know, this, if, I lost, if I lost out on a championship, you know, I may not have many, if any, to go back to after this. And uh, that level of determination is probably there among, among many, many of the Monaghan squad. Um, they've been around a while. If you remember last year, it was Maliki Rooks last year. It was after the disappointment of the All-Ireland semi-final that they might well have won against Tyrone the year before. 
and obviously just things didn't go so well for them in the, in that Cavan game and subsequently they peered out. I think there's a lot more enthusiasm around them this year. I'm not sure. Is it there with Cavan at the moment? Cavan have lost some key players, albeit they got Killian Clark back. They're still without Darren McVitie, who's away, who's very, very pivotal for them. Um, I suspect that Monaghan, there's just more to them. They're tuned in a bit more, and uh, I think I think they'll advance. And then you'd probably you'd you 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 would also I'd like just the the one thing I suppose where like it, it, like Oshin mentioned earlier there about the game last year, but the, like the game last year had the safety net. I just think that straight knockout cutthroat do or die element will smarten up Monaghan in in a way that maybe the the safety net or the back door might have kind of allowed a wee bit of element of complacency into their game in previous championship fixtures and. I would, I'd, I'd hazard a guess that'd be a fairly comfortable win for Monaghan. Actually, I think they, they, you know, I think they, they were they impressed me in a couple of league games that I've seen, and I think that they'll just have way too much for Cavan. So I, I wouldn't buy into the way. I don't. I really wouldn't buy into the way too much. I seen Cavan in the first round yeah. of the league against Armagh, and um, Armagh annihilated them. And I, honestly, I thought I wasn't sure if Cavan win any games uh, in Division Two. And they bounced back and won three games. And I, as I say, I think fairly unlucky to end up going down. Um, so I definitely wouldn't write off write off okay. Calvin in, in, in this match. Um, they're also like there's a serious carrot for both uh, Calvin and, and Monaghan on that side of the draw because there's a realistic opportunity to get into an Ulster final. Mickey Graham will realise that I dropped the Division Three, but if he gets to an Ulster final. Um, that will redeem a lot of what has gone on this season. So uh, I don't think there's going to be a lot in this. Yeah. And uh, Rory, you were talking about getting penalty shootout graphics made up considering yeah. the number of draws yeah. there have been between these. Yeah, I, I, this I, this I, could I, be, I just could be our first championship penalty shootout. Well, well, well this, this one's on Sky. So I would imagine that they'll have something cooked for this because they, as Oshin said there, he thinks it could be tighter and um, they, they might need the... You, like, that's another little bit of history. We still have not seen yeah. a penalty shootout in, a, in an inter-county championship match live on TV yet. So we could be looking at history this weekend one way or the other. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's stick with Ulster then and um, we'll go in chronological order. So Sunday, 1.30, Bally Buffet, Oshin the Small oh, yeah. Johnny Gall v Tyrone. Um, before we get into who's going to win it, um, I have to say that Conor McKenna the last two weeks has just has just been a revelation. I know he grew up kicking a round ball. He didn't need to learn how to do that again. But it's a few years since he played inter-county GA and it really didn't look it. And as we had a piece with Marty Clark on the website so today, um, he just, Marty Clark says, I think I could do a lot of the things that he can do. I just wouldn't dream of even trying. <laughs> For Marty Clark to say that, I think that says a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's he has been a revelation. He's hit the ground running, and to be honest, he doesn't look. He doesn't look. You know, he didn't. He, at, from me, from me, laying out in Bally with the first weekend, he didn't look too perturbed with anything that was going on. Any of the hits, any of the dragging off the ball, any of that sort of thing. He, he hardly touched the ball for forty-five minutes. Kept his head in the game. Finished the game strong. Looked as if he gives them a little something extra in the full forward lane, which they were trying to get through. Colin McCann and. And Colin McCann actually hasn't done bad when they've allowed him to stay in that full four lane. But McKenna gives him that little bit extra because he, he's got that scoring, scoring threat as well. He's sharp. Uh, I listened to a piece he, he did today um, with AIB and, and he men it mentioned that he, he, he played with uh, Wolf Tones for three or four weeks before he came home. Uh, a club that was founded by our man, and I don't know how he ended up getting being allowed to play with them. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, they but those, those three or four weeks obviously have helped him. But I think it's more about his attitude. And when I talk about his attitude, his attitude towards life and, and the way he just he throws himself into things. Uh, you know, what he I don't really think he ever really embraced the Aussie life. Um, and I think there was always a pang that he was going to come home. And uh, he talked about it. Um, every interview he did, he talked about, you know, coming home and playing for Tyrone. Um, and, you know, he would have needed, like the first day I seen him, I said, this is a guy who really needs 70 minutes. For football. But it turns out that's all he needed. 
it was okay. 70 minutes and, and again last week he was outstanding and, and uh, he just gives him that little bit extra. And right. you know what? A little bit of deflection away from, from Dara Canavan maybe as well because if uh, on normal circumstances Dara Canavan probably would have been the big story this week. He would have been heaping pressure on top of his shoulders whereas you know he's come in, he's got his 1-1, one, one, he's, been, he's been taken off and he's... Uh, and he's not the big. He's kind not of, the big. He's been story. protected. He's been protected to a certain degree, hasn't he, Osha? Yeah. Yeah, protected. I think on the field and and very much so off the field. And I think that that can only all go wild from. They do call him both of them in different ways. Derek and Conor McKenna. They offer something that Tyrone have lacked in the last few years. It, not just not scoring for as well that as well, but just that little bit of unpredictability that that kind of takes away a bit from the, the formulaic kind of style of football that I think we've all kind of come to expect a little bit from Tyrone. It's not to say it's not successful football, but you did kind of know what you were getting, whereas now there's, there's a wild card or two up there, isn't there? Very much so. I mean, if you were to compare it in, in transfer terms, it's like, uh, it's like Liverpool taking in Alisson and Van Dijk a few years ago. They're just, if you, if you, if you were to equate them with transfer acquisitions, it's just incredible the impact that they had in, in Castle Bar last weekend. Um, between them, they, they now have played three league matches. And here we are talking about them in terms of transformative impact on Tyrone, even the way they play. Tyrone, definitely, and obviously backed with the wind, I've never seen them kick as much long ball in as they did, whether it was to Peter Hart. Now, obviously, with the space that Mayo allowed, they invited it on, but... Peter Hart was on the end of some of the balls inside. Obviously, that magnificent pass from McKenna into Dara Canavan on the chest. You know, he could have taken a mark there, but he had the ambition to turn, swivel away, and score and score a goal. But the one thing that strikes me, McKenna, is his all-around game. He even laid on a pass for one of his colleagues, soccer style, just an outside, a slice kick. He just stabbed it along the ground. Uh, even at the end, then, he won a free. He came out and got a mark. It's just his industry and work. But what really struck me was the power he got in the shot for the two goals. He really emptied mm. himself off left and right. Now, I would say, ordinarily, I would back David Clark to have stopped or batted away both those shots. And he's done it over the last number of years. How many, how many in that situation has David Clark uh, been able to get his hand to him and, and beat back out? On either occasion, he wasn't because of the power that Conor McKenna generated. And you're right. He takes some of the focus away from from uh, from Dara Canavan, who who obviously will be a focus of of Donegal attention, but well able for it. His movement is fantastic, and there's no doubt Tyrone are coming into this game with a different dimension with both of those players. In that, you know, they can really McKenna can pass a ball. There is no question, and Tyrone must exploit that. Yeah, Roy, I, I think probably two three <clears throat> weeks ago, most people would have would have fancied Donegal in this match. Correct. And I'm sure many still do, but the, yep. there has been a lot of food for thought because largely because of, you know, two, shall we call them, uh, debutants or kind of reborn debutants. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? And yeah, I, this game, look, I straight up, I can't wait for it. And now we're going to be in Cork because we're hubbing the presentation from Cork. But like, if there was any game that I would absolutely love to be there to witness, it's Donegal to run in a straight knockout. Winner goes home, or sorry, winner goes on, loser goes home for the year. I mean, that's just, if that doesn't whet your appetite for championship football, I don't know what, what will. And just like, I mean, it's impossible to call, wouldn't even make a prediction. And, could easily go to extra time and penalties. You know, I wouldn't... Um, there's the Mickey Hart factor. Will he spring an old rabbit out of a hat? Has he done it already? Will he... You know, what kind of game plans will they employ? There's so much imponderables that makes it very, very difficult to start to make any sort of running judgment on farm lines or who's going to win. One little point I would like to make, though, before we move off Ulster, if, we, if that's what we are going to do, the ridiculous nature of this current format will bear itself out over the next three to four weeks in that you have Kerry and Dublin effectively hibernating and, you know, warming up the tools for their assault pretty much on semifinals and finals. Meanwhile, the Ulster lads having to literally 
knock lumps out of each other. Um, I think if this is a format that is to be continued, and I know we're heading into championship structures, but I think if this format is to be continued next year, because look, let's be honest, the virus is going nowhere and they may decide that another straight knockout championship is something that they have to employ just to get the fixtures played, then I think an open draw has to be considered because it is just simply unfair. I, I just come in there, Rory, on that. I probably would have agreed with you last June uh, on that, is that, oh, this is a great opportunity for an open draw. But you look at the travel arrangements required in the current climate yeah. For, yeah, that's true. For, uh, yeah. for an open draw and see what players have to do. Now, you know, what players are using dressing rooms to, to shower even after a game? Look at the journey time that Donegal players had to engage in to get to Kerry, Kerry to go to Monaghan driving in their cars in twos with a window down. That, 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 that's they're, absolutely they're, fair, Colin. I, yeah, I'd accept that. Yeah, I'd accept that. But and I think so that's where... I, they, I have to they, say, they, I have come around yeah. to thinking that if there is a championship, the best way was to organise it on this on this regional basis so that Tyrone, most Tyrone players drive an hour and a half to Bally Buffet. You know, most Armagh players drive an hour and a half, maybe two hours to Derry, whatever that's going to be. Um, it's the most... I don't think the island... Yeah, I know that. But I don't think the island is that big. And I think neutral venues halfway wouldn't necessarily... I think the issue was with Kerry having to drive all the ways to, yeah. to, Ma to Manin, for no, instance. For sure, I think if for Kerry, sure, if neutral Kerry venues, were, if, if this system... Yeah, if Kerry were driving to Leash yeah. and Monaghan were coming down to one more park, then I don't necessarily think that's an issue, uh, you know, as much of an issue. And you're into neutral, neutral venues and that would reduce an awful lot of the travelling time across the board. The island isn't that big after all. So, like, like I, I just think it is... An inherently unfair. You fifty percent of the teams in Division One next year are all from Ulster. You know, like they are. It is by far the strongest province. And this isn't me. And I would often have been critical of Ulster football in the past for blowing its own trumpet because I would have questioned the quality. But that's you can't say that anymore, given how many teams are actually competing at the top end of the leagues now. And I just think if this is a system that they have to employ in 2021. It's just not fair. It's just simply not fair. And your competition structures have to have some semblance of parity and fairness to give everybody the same chance. But even from the point of view that uh, Monaghan uh, played their last league match last last Sunday, six days out from from their uh, yeah. opening championship game, which is at half one or quarter past one on a Saturday afternoon, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can't understand why that game wasn't done on a Saturday. Give them that extra day. And the same with Mayo and Tyrone to give them the extra day just to prepare for that game. There's no something. difference. And we're, 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 we're mm. pulling at straws here a little bit. But still, in the, on, in the underfoot conditions and everything, you know, an extra day they'd probably benefit from. So I would have Big put time. on that. I think that would yeah. have been uh, just something to look at. Monaghan are lucky they didn't have a Europa League game. Um, Oshin, just to go back quickly then, like Tyrone, they, they, uh, they lost by four points to Donegal a couple of weeks ago. Um, now everybody is keen on Tyrone again. Um, but Pad talk of Paddy McBrearty being back for Donegal, which would obviously be huge. And they haven't become a bad team in two weeks just because and Tyrone they have, they have added a couple of players, are they? Yeah, and, and to be honest, um, there's, there's something a little bit different about uh, Donegal. If Donegal did show the hand a little bit against uh, Tyrone the first day, because I, I do believe that they wanted to get things done and dusted, I, want, I do believe they wanted to go to carry on their own terms and uh, rest players and give other players game time. Uh, it was important that they got some game time into Langan because I think he's somebody who they they that Declan Bonner really likes and he wants to start him. But there was a, there was a new luck to that half forward lane against their own. Uh, Pat O'Mogan uh, on the fringes, Neil O'Donnell on the fringes the past couple of years adds serious pace um, to that forward lane. The big thing for for me for for Tyrone was they they didn't put any pressure on Donegal's kickouts. Okay, so they decided to do that and decided to fall back and retreat. Donegal got through their defence really really easy. And on the opposite side, I could not believe that uh, Donegal put so much pressure on Morgan. And anything that went to the middle of the field, Donegal won. And if they play Langan and withdraw him into the middle of the field, that's only going to add to that. Uh, like, if you look, the basis of a lot of what Throne did well last week was based on how Morgan was able to get the ball away. And he wasn't able to get it away at all in Bally Buffet and the first round of the league. And that's where um, Throne really struggled. Throne, a little bit like Monaghan, uh, stuck in that game, got a penalty when the game was, uh, was already looking out of sight for them. 
got a penalty, stuck it away, and that sort of kept them in the game. But Donegal bossed the game uh, big time. There is one question mark uh, around Donegal in that two years ago when Tyrone went to Bally Buffet, Donegal held all the aces with, with 10 minutes to go in the game, maybe even five, uh, three points up and, and ended up losing the game. Last year they went down to Mayo in a must-win game and lost. There's still a question mark over um, when it's really put after them. So that's a question there. But I haven't seen them. You, if anybody was at the league match in Bally Buffet, you could not fancy Tyrone going into this game. Mm. Everything that everything that 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 you you think about Tyrone or or you think Tyrone have a serious chance is based on what they did against Mayo last week. Uh, that's not enough for me. Uh, I I see as I say from what I seen the first day. Uh, yes, Mickey Hart. Yes, Declan Bonham might have uh, showed his hand a little bit. Yes, Mickey Hart might have been holding a little bit back. No Peter Hart. Uh, Conor McKenna with another seventy minutes under his belt. Uh, no Dara Canavan. Um, you know. I still think that, for me, Donegal should win this game. If if Donegal don't win this game, it'll be for me. It'll be down to mentality, and uh, not what's uh, not what physically is going on the pitch. I love it. We talk about these bright, shining Tyrone forwards and how you know they can make a big impact. So she brings back. If you can't win your kick out, you can't win the game. Um, Colin, um, do you similarly see it for Donegal, or have you had alternative yeah, view? Yeah, uh, I think the number of one nineteen conceded to Mayo, uh, well, things went very well for them uh, with McKenna and Peter Hart at the other end and Derek Hannibal. Um I thought Mayo picked them open uh, very, very easily at times, created two goal chances in the first half, got a goal in the second half. I think Donegal's forward line is a step up from that. I think Donegal will control the ball for a lot longer than what Mayo were able to do. Um, I take the point, and Oshin, that's very, very true about that game in Bally Buffet two years ago, that last uh, round robin game in the quarterfinals. Uh, Donegal had that, and they didn't, they didn't squeeze it. But I think, I think they get there this time. I think their defence might just be uh, a little bit better able to cope with what's a top quality, two top quality forward lines coming in. But I think Donegal's defence just just uh, holds out a bit better. There is, Rory, there is just the, the talking about the Super 8 game and not squeezing it, the do or die. It's, like, it can't be ignored the fact that this is the first knockout championship game that any of these players will have ever played. You know, like one and done. Like this, this is very, very unusual. And it will add, <coughs> even without fans, the tension it will add, you know, every little, it'll highlight every error every score and you can just if it's tight coming into the last five ten minutes it's it's really going to come down a lot of it will come down as Oshin says to mentality that's it and the mentality is something that as you just mentioned is something that the players really haven't experienced since two like 20 years it's 20 years since we were in this i mean Oshin, you you would you played obviously in the last straight knockout championship not to say that's that i'm putting an age on you but i suppose that's true right like it's like i'd be interested is there a different is there a different approach like you're going into a straight knockout you know like is does it change or does it alter your mindset when you're inside the dressing room? Well, if they're using the dressing rooms, and they're not even too sure if home advantage is that much of a big deal, given the fact that it's a Valley Buffet. And also, when they did have the home advantage the last time round in that Super Eights game, Tyrone went in and raided the place and came away with the points by knocking Donegal out of it, which was what two years ago, I think. So maybe not, the crowd not being there. I, it's 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 the whole thing is all very new, and like I think that purity maybe comes back to what we loved about championship football from when I grew up. It's, all, it's going to be about on the day. Who can produce it on the day? And this, this is real throwback. And I just, I'm just really looking forward to it. I just can't wait. I'm really, really looking forward to it now. Yeah, no, I think going back on, on, you know, 20 years ago, I think we didn't know any different. So, like, yeah. if, you're for, if you're from Armagh, when I first went into the panel, uh, the way things went was you played the National League, we got beaten the first round of the Championship, and we went off, and we did our club thing, and we came back from the National League again. Uh, there was no opportunity to build any sort of camaraderie within the squad or anything like that. And I think that's what I noticed in particular. Even, bef even the fact that we were starting to get runs in the Championship, we won... Uh, 99, uh, 2000, 
But what I started to notice was even the years where things didn't go great for us, even 2003 after we won the All-Ireland, we still were able to regroup. We, were, we got a draw on Waterford. And you were able to rebuild something. Whereas with straight knockouts, it is very, very demoralizing. And it's very, what I found was, mm -hmm. and it's maybe a little bit different now, but what I found was that it was very difficult to pick things up uh, and run with them again. It was almost like you're starting again from afresh. Now, now there's, there's an argument that two games isn't going to help all that much, but it definitely changes the mindset a little bit because uh, it puts a huge amount of pressure on players to deliver in what is a one-off game, you know? Yeah. Well, as you said, it's going to be, it's going to be really fascinating. Um, we won't leave Ulster without mentioning your, your, own, your, your own county there, Oisín. Um Overwhelming favourites against Derry, even if I, we were I mean, chatting with a few of your county men, like Aidan O'Rourke and a few other people, you, they don't make it easy for supporters. They are fantastic. They look like a Division 1 team for 20 minutes and then they can look like a Division 4 team for 10 minutes. And nothing seems to be that straightforward, but that said, they're better than Derry, aren't they? Uh, again, one's a Division 1 team now, one's a Division 3 team. There's definitely not that golf. Uh, uh, Derry have looked much better, more, much more cohesive. Uh, Derry's, see, Derry's league season uh, came down to the, the match in, in, uh, in Newry. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, Nathan February, but it was absolutely horrendous. Wow. And they probably should have eked out a win. If they had done that, they would have got promoted. Uh, I look at them as a, a better version of Fermanagh if that makes any sense. It's still the same type of football, but this, they have some quality up front and that makes a hell of a lot of difference. Lads, McGuigan is McGuigan's as good as what's around at the minute. Uh, he's transferred his college form, club form. He's more physical. Uh, he's able to... He, uh, two years ago when they, when they played Tyrone in, the, uh, in Oma in, in the championship, uh, he's able to hold his own against a mass defence, against Ronan McNamee. So if he can do that against them, uh, and and he stepped up a little bit, I'm pretty sure he can do it against them. Uh, I, I'm worried about this game, lads. Really worried because uh, I'm a, don't do mass defence all that well. Uh, we tend to get very impatient. And um, I, I'm, I, as I say, I'm worried about that. Derry have looked as if everybody has bought into what uh, the Rory Gallagher system over the last, as I say, the last couple of league games. And as an Armagh man, I, I am, I'm, gen I'm genuinely worried, but I still think it's a game we realistically should be winning. Yeah. Colin, it's Shane McGuigan. It, it, fantastic. And the, that what, what Oshin says there is true, isn't it? There's no point Rory Gallagher bringing in his system of play if you don't get complete an utter buy-in for because that's what it takes, isn't it? Because if there's one, if there's one weak link in that chain, it doesn't work. So that if Derry can completely buy into it, and if they have those couple of quality forwards, it does make them a very different proposition from the Derry of two years ago, doesn't it? Yeah, and they have one, they have one of the great leaders in the game at the moment, Chrissy McCaig, and he's coming off the back of a very, very good clam, club campaign. And, uh, you know... The, Word coming out, there he is. He's you know he's refreshed and invigorated, and they also have the impact of an AFL returnee in Connor Glass as well, who uh, who's put a, a bit of game time. He obviously he came back a little bit later than Connor McKenna. It seems he was only back probably last week or the week before, but just be, the week before the um, their initial their first game back. So uh, his impact might be a little bit slower, but I feel it'll be profound nonetheless because you consider. Of all the players that have gone out there, Glass and McKenna were among two of the best Gaelic footballers before they left. Glass had a fantastic reputation at underage and schools level. Obviously, McKenna with the Tyrone Miners as well. Um, so I think there will be an impact felt there. Obviously, McGuigan, as, as, as Oshin has pointed out. And, you know, maybe Derry, I'd imagine Rory Gallagher has been pitching for a, a longer term vision with, with this Derry team and that he feels they need to be physically stronger, where Armagh seemed to be, you know, coming close to a physical peak, looking at them, certainly the night against Roscommon, albeit I thought their discipline let them down a little bit that day. But I think the fact that Armagh went to Ennis and ground out a result when the match was a draw coming down the home straight at one stage and were able to kick on and win it, 
good psychological lift there. You know, it's probably been thrown. It was good at, character. Yeah. yeah, it's been thrown thrown at them a little bit that when it really matters, they don't they don't go and win those type of games. Well, they won one here, and let's not underestimate Clare by any stretch because that's a decent Clare team that have been Absolutely. operating at a, at a high level, top twelve all the time, just around the twelve mark all the time under Colin mm-hmm. Collins. He's got them to Division One and held them at a level. Larma went down, and they won that game. They'll get a bounce from that, and I think they'll go into Celtic Park. They'll win. They'll have to be patient, and they'll have to rely on some of their good long-range kickers, the O'Neills, Garcazon, Campbell, to take points from distance and be patient. And if they're patient and uh, they're, they're they're willing to see this out, I think they win this game. And we spoke and we spoke we spoke earlier as well, Mikey, about uh, the scoring trends in hurling and how much you know, like uh, mm. we're seeing nearly too many scores. I don't I don't think we will need to worry about that in this. <laughs> in this game, in this game, <laughs> somehow, g- g- given 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 the weather that's forecast, and given the way that Derry will uh, obviously set up, but yeah, you yeah. would hope uh, you you see you could see Armagh just with the spread the talent that they have up front that they that they would uh, that they'd get over the line. Right. Uh, to anyone who ever talks about RTE ignoring Ulster, etc., we've spoken about Ulster football for half an hour, and we're now going to spend about thirty Fantastic. seconds talking about Munster, Connacht, and Leinster. Because brutally honest, we're not talking about all Ireland contenders here. Waterford, uh, uh, Waterford v Limerick and Clare v Tip has a little bit of there's there's a little bit of uh, in not there's interest in all these matches, but Tipperary v Clare on paper Clare should win that column, but Tipperary will be um, they won't be any pushovers, and you wouldn't want to put too much pass on league position here, would you? Um. No, I think it'll be. I think it'll be pretty close. As I said in the in in the previous um, stretch, there, I think they're just operating at a higher level. Albeit Tipperary have Michael Quinlevin back, he wasn't intending to play. Nor nor were Jamie Malone and uh, Gary Brennan, but they're both back for for Clare too. I, I think there's more up front for Clare, even notwithstanding you know Quinlevin's presence for Tipperary, and they have been operating at a very good level. And you know, you recall. They went to they went to Cavan earlier in the year and won that game and that's ultimately what what kept them up. Yeah. So I think those type of results really anchors them well. And you know, there's a really there's a place that's in the Munster final against uh, against Cork and Kerry here at stake. And I think Clare will uh, will exploit that. Um, we talked a bit about Mayo earlier, Oshin. They they dropped to Division Two. James Horn didn't seem to be um, didn't seem to be beating himself up too much about it. Um, Leitrim back in Division Four would have spent an awful lot of time. There's there's only one result here. Uh, you have to assume. Yeah, um, <clears throat> seen a bit of Leitrim and uh, Tipperary last week. It was Leitrim were very competitive. They definitely have improved, but like Mayo would have way too much for for Leitrim uh, this weekend. Uh, and you'd expect, you know, had Mayo won last week. You could expect some sort of complacency going into the game, but uh, the fact that they are in the position that they are, I'd say that they'll hit the ground running big time. So, you know, I can only see Mayo win that game comfortably. Mm. Um, Colm, your special subject at Leinster Football Championship. Um, Loud Longford, Offaly Carlo, Wexford Wicklow. Um, no lads have gone away to America. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a full, full strength squads here as best as we know it. Um, obviously, we all know we're just seeing who gets to be chum against Dublin, but at the same time, Wexford Wicklow is intriguing in that they played last weekend in the worst conditions ever, and quite possibly will play again in the worst conditions ever down in Wexford. Um, the, the tragic thing, as we always say about the Leicester Football Championship, if you take Dublin out of it, it'd probably be the most competitive of the lot. <laughs> Actually, you mentioned not no players there. Brendan Murphy and Sean Murphy it won't be playing with Carlo against Offaly. That probably gives Offaly the advantage in that game, I would imagine. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think Mickey Quinn is going to be available for Longford. Uh, that takes something from them uh, against Loud. I still anticipate they'll win it, uh, albeit they didn't fulfil their fixture last week against Cork. And Wicklow, I would expect to repeat that win over Wexford. Um, this is a there's a lot happening at underage level in in Wicklow, and we may start to see the beginning of that manifest at senior level. And really good manager Davy Burke, who's had a lot of success over the last two or three years mm. with. Uh, Obviously, with the Kildare under twenties, then he went in and took out a Kildare title with uh, with Sarsfields last year, and now he goes into Wicklow and gets the bounce with them, and they get promoted uh, last weekend. So really, he'd cap a very very fine season if they go and win win this game. They've shown he furlong back, who's always a good turn for 
for, uh, for, for Wicklow. So I anticipate that that three-point gap that was there last weekend will hold. I'm getting a half three and half jersey, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, the three games the three games are live on GA Go, Mikey, as yeah. we know. And uh, one thing I would be saying to certainly to the cameramen is to make sure they bring extra batteries because... Uh, I don't think there's going to be much in some of them. There's a couple of derbies thrown in there as well. And um, you could be in for a long afternoon in terms of extra time. And I wouldn't be surprised to see penalties emerge in one of those games. Anyway, certainly. Yeah. Wexford Wicklow has to be penalty. Has to go to penalties. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely has to. That, be, that will be the crack. Well, I'd have the, um, I can't remember his name, but the Wicklow goalkeeper should be first up. I, I watched the league game last week on GA Go as well. Um, and I have to say that the Wicklow keeper, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone with a kick like him. He has an absolute howitzer of a foot. So it wouldn't matter where he yeah. plays his penalty, it would just t- he'd take the Wicklow keeper with him into the net. He's a phenomenal kick on him. I had to get clarification around the rules, actually, just to make sure in my own head. No, I kind of knew this anyway, but it's a, it's a funny one. So if, it, if, if penalties is to happen, you, you nominate your five penalty, ki- your penalty takers, penalty kick or puck, depending whichever, hurling a football. But it can only be them five then. So if, once you get to the end of the fifth one, it's the same five again. Now, it can be the guy who took the fifth, he can take the sixth. But you can't dip into the other members of your panel. Do you know, you know. So like if someone's after missing one, he may have to take another one. You know? so, <laughs> Goes to the back of the queue. That's kind it of a nonsense, isn't it? Doubt it is something yeah. that teams, teams will be practicing. There is no question. They'd have to. They, they, the uh, you, will, yeah. have five, will have five penalty takers in mind uh, and, and should have. And if they're not, well, you know, they're leaving, they're, they're leaving yeah. themselves short. What do you think of that, Oshin? Do you, do you think it should be five on repeat? Or like surely the 15, 14, 13 who finish the match, surely everybody should take a penalty. I, I know we don't have to ape everything from soccer, but to me, yeah. that seems like the purest form of a penalty shootout. There's a couple of cornerbacks I play with, but I wouldn't fancy them stepping up to take a penalty. So <laughs> I wouldn't like. I wouldn't like to go. I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't like to go too deep into the, into the squad on, on the old penalties. I think they hadn't passed the penalty. But the GA, if we get the penalty, <laughs> shoot Fra- Francie, Francie ever take a penalty, Osh? <laughs> you wouldn't even take it in training. <laughs> um, so I, I think with the GA, we just we, we'd appreciate the drama of the penalties but any further drama I don't I don't know if we're ready for that yet I don't know if we're ready for <laughs> a number two stepping on and hitting we, the penalty yeah, yeah. We, we have to ration this drama I just want to say sorry I had to look it up because it's not fair to mention he was fantastic and I'll have his name Mark Jackson is the name of the Wicklow goalkeeper he scored three frees the other day and one of them he kicked into a gale I don't know how he did it it's phenomenal um all right, lads, I think we've previewed everything. We gave everyone their fair mention, but let's be honest, I think it's Ulster where we're all most interested uh, this Ulster, weekend. Yeah. Um, every game is view- it can be viewed, as Rory's mentioned a few times. Correct. Diego, RTE2, the News Channel, BBC Northern Ireland, and Sky. Every single game can be watched, so everybody have fun. Gorge yourselves, and if you want to listen to the radio, Saturday and Sunday Sport will have you covered. And if, there's some, if you like an old match tracker or a live blog, the RTE website and news app as well. So I think that's about it. I'll say thank you very much to Colm and Rory for their marathon stint. Oshin just came in for the Cheers, second Mikey. Half, But uh, he's a finisher, as they say in rugby. That's Thanks, Mikey. Um, we will catch you all again next week. Thank you very much. Crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it.